Okay, I was born in Dundalk, Maryland on the eastern uh, border of Baltimore City, out in the county, Baltimore County. And I grew up there with many Italian kids and families, Polish and, uh, and German because uh, it was before, right before World War II, the Germans all escaped to Baltimore where there was plenty of good jobs and work to be done. I liked the kids. Uh, I loved the girls, the Italian girls, they were pretty. We did a lot of things together, us uh, southern people out of the south who came there looking for work during uh, the early part of World War II. And uh, we had a good time. We would get on a streetcar, the old number 26 streetcar, and ride into Baltimore where we'd meet up with uh, other people, go to Little Italy, where uh, they had a reputation of beating the hell out of anybody that walked into middle into Little Italy, but I swear I never had any problem at all with, with that. Even during the war, we all built parts for airplanes and tanks and stuff like that, and it was a part of our dedication to winning the war. We felt as if we were soldiers of the free world or something by manufacturing in our spare time. You went to school and then in the evenings you went home and then you usually had uh, some machinery there that you could use to make things. Parts for airplanes or guns or ships or whatever it might have been. And uh, we were very proud of that. We collected aluminum and we kept our we collected copper and brass and bronze and good steel. We carried it to the fire department and they stored it in bins and turned it over to the war department, I guess. And uh, so that was our contribution to World War II. We worried about being bombed because uh, nobody could imagine that Germany couldn't build a four motor bomber that could fly to America and drop bombs. But for some reason, they couldn't. So we had air raid curtains on our windows because we had machinery in the basement and was making parts for the Glen L. Martin B-26 bombers, uh, PBM seaplanes. We'd, we'd close off the windows of the basement so the light couldn't escape. And we had a curtain hanging on the stairway going down into the basement. And we'd turn out all the lights on the first and second floor of the house. The air raid warden would come around and check to make sure that there was no uh, light leaking out because we had everything turned off upstairs and uh, and they'd give you approval if, if you weren't leaking any light. They said that if, you, if the house was leaking light, it was a target for a bomber up to maybe 30,000 feet. Well, there wasn't any German bombers up to 30,000 feet flying across the Atlantic Ocean because they couldn't build them. We had time, though, on Saturdays and Sundays, mostly on Sundays, because a lot of times we'd work a half a day on Saturday. That was part of our education. I became a machinist because of that. Later on, at about the ninth grade, I was interested only in the things that would make me a machinist, and, uh, uh, and that's all I cared about. Bethlehem Steel took me in as an apprentice machinist and agreed to finish my high school education while I was doing that. I worked eight hours a day, and they took the last hour and paid my tuition for one class, one hour class. I paid for the next hour myself out of, out of my wages and, uh, and went to school. So over a period of five years, four years apprenticeship and one year of uh, education, I managed to uh, make my way through high school, but I didn't get a diploma. I got a certificate saying that I had put in the time, but my grades were extremely high. I had been failing in in public school, but in uh, in their school, because I was doing something I was interested in and, I, and the schooling applied to it, I achieved a 90% average uh, on my grades. And so I did pretty daggone well in that schooling. But that wasn't all I got. They decided, Bethlehem Steel thought that every machinist should understand steel, understand the making of it, the hardening of it, uh, uh, and everything about it that you could possibly know. So at 16 years old, I considered myself a steel-making man. Now, that was kind of a joke, but uh, that's what I thought I was. I had spent, in the first year, I had spent a month in every department in Bethlehem Steel. The first month was at the open, uh, open hearth, uh, Bessemer converters, 
and then over to the uh, Coke ovens where I made Coke out of coal to make steel with. You gotta have Coke to make steel. You can't make steel without without uh, coal. So any country that refuses to mine coal anymore will not be able to make steel and they won't be able to fight a war without it. So it's a death knell to stop mining coke to make steel for any free country. Well, you know, after the war, we spent a lot of time hiking to the mountains and hiking to Patapsico State Park where we camped and what have you. We actually spent a night inside of a old, uh, unused dam when a hurricane come across Maryland and, and dumped, I don't know, 30 inches of water or something like that. I've forgotten how much, how much it was. But So us boys spent the night in there and uh, uh, my parents drove out to their, uh, out to the uh, state park and uh, to get us boys and were horrified when they found out we were down inside that dam with tons and tons of water pouring over top of it and the old rotten dam looking awful. It had... Uh, had three gates inside where there had been uh, water turbines in there to generate electricity, and they took they took them out because the floor was breaking up from from high water coming up in there and, and busting the floor up. Uh, so we spent a lot of time in that dam, scared half to death. But anyhow, they got us out. Dad climbed down and yelled at us, and we come we come grabbed up our stuff and come out and got in the car and went back to Dundalk. Well, that was a, a way of getting to know being out in the woods and camping and hiking on your own and that kind of thing. Uh, we had a Boy Scout uh, assistant leader uh, who was from Scotland. And the old man, a little short fellow, but shoulders wider than the average door. And... Uh, his head was stuffed down into his neck, which was bigger than his head. He wore kilts when we went on a hike. He wore kilts, and he played bagpipes. And he gave us march. We didn't hike anywhere. We marched everywhere we went. I guess it was good for us. Some of the, some of the boys became soldiers after the war because they liked that. They thought it was great stuff to be uh, marching and soldiering like we were doing. But, you know, after that, I met a girl, a uh, young lady at a carnival. I met her on the Ferris wheel, and we kind of fell in love. She was Irish gal, Irish uh, immigrant. Her family were Irish immigrants, and they they had a weird attitude. They, uh, they loved each other, would fight to the death to protect each other, but... Uh, if anybody said anything about any of them, they would all jump on that person. The father was a bad drunk. He uh, uh, beat the mother and beat the girls. And my, uh, my girlfriend at that time put her little sister out the window, out into the yard, because he was going to beat that little girl. And, uh, uh, and I threatened to kill him with the poker out of the wood stove they had in the living room to keep the house warm. But anyhow... Her and I went to Gunpowder Falls to swim a lot of times on Sunday afternoons, and nobody else went up there. We had to place to ourselves. There was a big waterfall there about, uh, I don't know, probably 40 feet high, and it poured water down in there, a stream about, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 feet wide, and a couple feet deep, and so it poured streamed water down into the pond below, and we'd go down in that pond and swim, it was full of fish. You could, uh, my golly, you could uh, you could grab a hold of them as you're sw swimming in there sometimes, and uh, so we'd wind up with a basket, half a basket full of fish uh, to take home. We, we had a wonderful time, and like young people who swim too much together, they w w we did a lot of other things too much. But anyhow, uh, I finally married her, and we were all all in love, and uh, of course it didn't work. Her way of living was so much uh, different. We were than married, mine. happily married, for about four years, and another four years, uh, I had decided I was going to get out of that, and uh, so I spent four years uh, dreading divorce, and uh, but that's the way it was. We finally divorced, and I remarried, and have been happy ever since. But uh, I just couldn't stand the family. 
anyway, uh, uh, we, uh, we young men hiked out to the, uh, uh, Blue Ridge Mountains every now and then. Never did much climbing the mountains, but we, we hiked out into that area every now and then. And it was a fellow named Jack Soth that uh, uh, was about 27 years old. We were all 18, 17, so, such as that. And uh, Jack had hiked all the way from Alaska to the tip of South America over a period of many years. I think he probably hiked... Uh, uh, 500 miles a year or something like that. I don't know how, how much, but uh, he taught us boys a lot of stuff. But you know, the hiking equipment was awful. It was ex-military uh, army surplus uh, stuff, and it was heavy, and it, and it was coarse, and, and uh, the tents were, you, you had a half a pup tent, so you had to have a, somebody else, uh, a buddy who would have the other half of a pup that you'd put the two together to make one whole tent and you'd both sleep in the, in the same tent. And, uh, but it was heavy stuff to carry. And uh, uh, me being shorter than some of the others was a bigger load on me than it was some of them who were a lot bigger fellows than I was. Hey, well, I grew up in Dundalk and was an adult there. And I didn't know that Baltimoreans were different than we from the South, had come from the South were. And uh, there was, they, they, we had a, had a time. Uh, we, I used to go to Patterson Park. I had a buddy there that had lived in Dundalk and his mother who was single. Uh, moved back to Baltimore where she was from and uh, she had a little row house there uh, of uh, Patterson Park. Now Patterson Park had been a battlefield many many well the war of 1812 yeah the war of 1812 when the British attacked Baltimore uh, and uh, uh, the uh, national anthem was written about uh, the ship shooting at uh, uh, the fort there uh, where the American flag flew and uh, how uh, when he got up in the morning the flag was still flying and so on and so forth. I knew a lot of people whose families had fought in the war 1812. Uh, a Mr. McClellan was one of them. Uh, his father had fought in the war of 1812. Now Mr. McClellan was almost 90 years old and he had a little shop in in uh, in a building on his property down by the water, and he had made parts for boats and ships even. And uh, he was a hard the old man was a hard worker, and he he was a good friend to me. Uh, I used to go by, and he taught me things about blacksmithing. He was a blacksmith, and he was about half a machinist, and he could sh he could machine propeller shafts, and he could hammer out uh, fittings for boats, and he could make all kinds of things out of steel and, and uh, I had, I knew about steel because I had been taught that, uh, the making of iron and the making of steel at Bethlehem Steel. I was well schooled in uh, that kind of industry. All good things come to an end. Bethlehem Steel, uh, in the making of steel, the byproduct, the making of iron, the byproduct of which is uh, cast iron and the byproduct of making cast iron is uh, slag. Well, Bethlehem Steel, built on the edge of the water at Spires Point, dumped slag into the Chesapeake Bay to make more land so they could have free, untaxable land to put their uh, put more mills on. Rockfish were getting short in the Chesapeake Bay. There weren't as many of them because there were thousands upon thousands of fish nets along the Chesapeake Bay going to the uh, uh, to the river that uh, come down out of Pennsylvania into the bay where rockfish thrived. Well, they caught so many of them that there were getting to be fewer and fewer rockfish and the fishermen were fussing about it. Well, both of them but the, uh, the government in Maryland decided that that the uh, the problem was that Bethlehem Steel was dumping slag in the bay to make land, and uh, 
and that was killing the rockfish. So they stopped them from doing it. Well, Bethlehem Steel had no place to put the slag. Uh, there was there was there were parks nearby and all, and they couldn't they couldn't dump the slag on land. So they had no choice but to go out of business. Well, the government, democratic government, uh, thought that was a great thing that they went that they should go out of business because they were putting smoke into the air and slag in the water, and uh, we didn't need them anyhow. Well, you know today. We can't hardly make steel anymore because they've also stopped people in uh, Minnesota, up there, Minnesota mining, from uh, uh, getting uh, uh, dirt loaded with iron ore out of there to take to the to take to the steel mills, and they needed coal to make steel. Well, they, in their short-mindedness. Uh, had basically done away with steel making in America, and China's making it now, mostly China. And uh, we can't even trust the steel they make because it's made to much lower standards than American steel was. We made railroad rails that were high-speed rails and and uh, had uh, were certified for a hundred miles an hour and that kind of thing. And uh, today we have trouble with uh, uh, the uh, steel that's coming from China, have trouble with the rails because they're not high-speed rails and they're running at uh, boxcars heavily loaded at uh, uh, 70 and 80 miles an hour. And uh, when they start slowing down to come to a town, the uh, the brakes on the wheels cause the wheels to heat up, which are also not made of high quality steel anymore. And the bearings in them uh, are, many of them are still sleeve bearings instead of uh, roller bearings. So the wheels heat up and the cars crash into each other when they put the brakes on. And uh, they, a lot of them, some of them are carrying hazardous waste. and. Uh, uh, that causes all kinds of problems. They had some crash in Ohio in a small town and totally ruined the small town. It went into the streams and the, uh, the poisons that was in those boxcars went into the streams and killing fish by the thousands and going into drinking water and uh, making the town almost completely unlivable. And it may never... Uh, return from that. It may never get any better. Well, I hate to think about that, but that's kind of the way it is today. We buy our steel, uh, low quality steel from China and expect it to do the same job that the high quality steel that we made at Bethlehem Steel and United States Steel and all of those places all up and down the, uh, in Ohio and in uh, Pennsylvania and in Maryland and so on. We had plenty of steel in those days, but we don't now. Okay, now I know one thing. <coughs> if I had my way, we would continue mining coal in order to make uh, uh, steel. And, uh, well, a long time ago, one of my relatives... Uh, in the South, was uh, uh, forced into the uh, uh, to the army. Uh, he was a, a teacher and well educated, and they took him in the army to be a surveyor for building forts and dams and all kinds of things that the army needed. But instead, they sent him up to the hills of North Carolina uh, to wander the wander the uh, forests and the hills, looking for Yankee soldiers that were hiding out up there to come and coming down and attacking small towns and farms and places like that. Well, 
he come walking over the top of a hill and down the other side of it to come up on a stream where there was a waterfall and there was a beautiful woman standing between two rocks leaning together and a, there was a man up at the top laying crossways the stream so to raise the water level so water would pour down between those rocks and she could take a shower in there and of course she was naked as a jaybird and so was he but anyhow uh he stood and watched them for quite a while until finally she came out and they laid down on a rock to sun themselves uh, to dry out the two of them and uh, he, he stepped on a branch that crackled and uh, uh, the, uh, the fellow turned around and shot at him and he shot a couple times and missed him every time he was the guy was nervous and turned out he had a, a military uniform laying on another rock there he was an officer of the uh, uh, northern army and uh, uh, so this fellow shot the guy and started to shoot the girl too and then realized that she was probably innocent of any wrongdoing other than falling in love with him uh, with an army man and uh, so he didn't shoot her he told her to get over there get her clothes and get out of there and she did she uh, grabbed up her uh, her dress and underwear and clothes and all that and made off into the woods well he uh, he looked at the man laying there dead and uh, when he died, uh, he peed all over himself, and uh, and that fella felt mighty bad. He he uh, he felt like he had murdered somebody rather than killing the enemy, and he had a hard time. His buddies come running down there, patting him on the back and shaking his hand and all that, and uh, that he was a great warrior and blah blah blah. And uh, uh, so it was a bad situation. Well, it reminded me of a time when I was a young fella. I was about 14. I uh, had one of my older school buddies who was a couple of years older than me. And I went up to the uh, Cascade Trail in the Patapsico State Forest, and we took a shower in the river up there. And we did the same thing. One of us laid across the river so that the water showered down between a couple rocks. And I guess that's where I got the idea for the other story. And uh, uh, and then we went and laid down on a rock. We didn't have any towels or anything, so we laid down on a rock to sun ourselves dry. Here come a bunch of Girl Scouts walking up the path along the side, the, uh, beside the stream. And they were, <laughs> they were kind of young. And anyway, so we didn't make any move to cover ourselves up or anything. Uh, the other boys said, just lay still, lay still. They won't even see us. Well, the scout leader, uh, they did see us. They was giggling and carried on. And the scout leader, uh, Girl Scout leader, uh, was looking up into trees and telling the pointing at the, the tr tops of the trees and telling the girls to look up there at the birds and this, that, and the other. Because they didn't want them young girls looking at them couple of teenage boys we uh, we were old enough to have hair on our privates so uh, <laughs> anyway uh, we had a lot of adventures like that I you know I got on a streetcar in Dundalk took the streetcar in Baltimore cost a nickel to ride a streetcar and you could get a uh, uh, transfer free so as long as you was traveling west on a streetcar, you could get a transfer to get on another streetcar that was basically going west, but maybe going to a different destination that you were going on on that streetcar. And, uh, and so we took a streetcar anywhere we wanted to go. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you, a streetcar would come to a stop and they had a cable on the back end of them uh, that went up to a, 
a pole that had a wheel on the end that rode on a power line up there over top of the streetcar. Well, we would we would run along behind the streetcar and jump on the back bumper and hang on to that cable and ride the streetcar. Well, once in a while, the conductor, uh, they would stop it at a traffic light. The conductor would get out and run us off. Sometimes a policeman would run up behind us and run us off. And we'd run down an alley, uh, in, go in a hardware store and back out the front and down some other way or another and get away from the police because we were pretty, we may not have been as fast as the police, but we were pretty agile. And uh, you could even hide behind a counter sometime in the store and the policeman would run through the store and out the other end of it while you were still in there and you'd go back and hop a streetcar and be gone. Well, all of that was great fun, and uh, uh, some of it we did when we were old enough to be thrown in jail, and but we thought it was great fun to elude the policeman. But just boys got into an old car, a friend of mine, Joe Hollifield, uh, was driving, it was his car, and we all got in the back of it, and uh, we didn't have any tags on the car, we'd bought the car for 25 bucks, and uh, and and we did so we didn't have any tags on it. The police took off after us. Well, we tried to outrun them, or Joe tried to outrun them, and uh, we went flying out Hartford Road with the police behind us, and we ducked down a couple of streets and uh, back and forth other ways, and with the cops still chasing us, till we got to the uh, uh, city board, city county line. We drove out into the uh, county, and the city police couldn't go out into the county. They'd get in a shooting war with the county police. They they hated each other. So uh, we'd be out in the county then, and, and of course we were safe from the police. Uh, I had that same buddy, Joe, got caught. Him and some other boys stole the police for, uh, stole the, uh, a, a, uh, a pistol out of a waterfront house down on Bear Creek, and they got caught, and they put him in jail. He was he was 16, I think. They put him in jail, uh, and he ran into another fellow out there that that he they were jailmates in the same uh, same cell, and uh, they uh, uh, they got into a. a a bad time, and they let finally they let Joe out, and uh, uh, we were all great buddies. And Joe was apt to to break the law a little. We were all in danger of getting into serious trouble. Uh, one of the things we did was we bought an old old car. You could buy old cars after World War II for twenty five or fifty dollars. We bought an old uh, Packard. And there was a bathing beach there in Dundalk, and a road that went down to the bathing beach was sand, and from cars running up and down it, it was it had kind of dug down into the ground with a sand bank on either side of the road, and uh, we went a hell of a down that uh, road, and uh, uh, swung around a curb, and the car slid sideways, and the wheels hit that bank. Uh, flipped the car over and we rolled off into the field. Well, we all it was, there were so many of us in the car that nobody got hurt. You couldn't get hurt. You couldn't even rattle around hardly in it. And uh, <coughs> so anyway, we got out of the car. We got we got up off the ground and rolled the car back up on its wheels and took off again. And it was so much fun rolling around in that car that uh, we did it again. We got back out on that little road and went on hell on down the road again, slammed into the bank and rolled off into the field. Well, we did it three times till the engine ran out, all the oil leaked out of the engine, and the engine ex blew up. Didn't explode, it blew up. And uh, it wouldn't run anymore. So we pushed the car out of the road and uh, in, over into the grass and left it. And that was the end of that tale. Now, uh, 
a bunch of us went up into uh, Baltimore down to the waterfront. And there was a, 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 a Navy ship from England tied up at the dock. And we went down there close, not too far from the ship. And I yelled, screw the queen. Well, they didn't take kindly to that at all. And here come a whole bunch of sailors running down the uh, gangplank after us. We took off running, uh, went into uh, uh, a five and ten, ran out the back door into a beer joint, through the back, back room, and through the front of the beer joint, and back out onto another road down an alley, caught a streetcar, and left. Well, <laughs> we were no match for them sailors. Some of them suckers was big, and uh, they'd have beat the hell out of us if they'd have caught us. But, you know, boys will be boys, and we did stuff that we shouldn't have done. And uh, one of the things <coughs> was we got on a streetcar and went down town to Baltimore, Baltimore Street, Baltimore's two blocks, where there was the Gaddy and the uh, Clover and another uh, movie theater. Uh, we went into the Gaddy, no, we went into the uh, uh, Clover to watch a movie, and then afterwards they had a, uh, a strip show. And these girls all worked full-time at the Gaiety. But when there was a, uh, after the movie was over, there was a time when they would come over to the uh, Clover and the, uh, uh, and dance. Oh, we all thought that was great, great, because they were almost naked. And a guy come out on the stage, big fella, he walked out on the stage and he said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, here in my hand, I have a nutcracker. And it was made from King Tut's nut. And uh, if you wave that in front of a girl, she will fall every bit in love with you. Well, here come this other guy with a cocked, half cocked derby on uh, and a pair of uh, 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 farmer's uh, dungarees and, and uh, suspenders. And uh, he said, I don't believe you. And the guy says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, I'll show you. And he called a couple of girls. A couple of girls come out there, three of them, I think, come out there on a the stage. And he waved that tweeter in front of their nose, and, every, and both of them jumped all over him and threw their legs and arms around him and started kissing him all over. Guess he's bald headed, he was bald headed. And, uh, uh, and the guy said, the other guy says, well, I'll be doggone, isn't that something? And he said, yeah, he says, these things is worth a lot of money, though. They gotta come from, uh, they have to come from uh, Egypt, where King Tut is buried, and they had to sneak into the into the tomb and cut his nuts off and put them into a bag and brought them back to the U.S. and this is them. And he said, uh, "Now, I'll tell you what I'll do. I have to get ten dollars for these, but for you, I'll sell it to you for nine dollars." And so the guy peeled out some money and gave him nine dollars, and he, and uh, he gave him the bag with uh, King Tut's nut in it. Well, then he turned around to the audience and he says, "Now I'll tell you what." He said, "That's not the last of them." He said, "I only put part of them in there, and uh, the last of them is in this bag, and I'll sell them to you, not for five dollars, not for three dollars, not for one dollar." I'll sell you a bag of these for 50 cents. Well, everybody in the place bought a bag of King Tut's nuts. 
And uh, uh, of course, he didn't work too good because uh, the girls didn't know what the heck the story was if you waved it in front of their nose and down in Dundalk. <laughs> But we had a good time there. That was a big joke, and we, we all laughed about it, and it was wonderful. Well, a year later, I was in that part of town and uh, stopped at the Gaddy, was walking past the Gaddy, and out come Belle Star, stood out on the street and lit up a cigarette. And I stood talking to her and asked her who she was. She said, I'm Belle Star. And we stood out there. I was... I don't know, probably 17, I don't know how old it was, but anyway, I was young. And, uh, oh, she, uh, she, she gave me a big kiss on the forehead, and, uh, and we stood there and talked, and she was the nicest person. I really enjoyed talking to her. She was smart, too. And uh, she, she was the one that had sex with a donkey on stage. She was a real tramp. But anyway, I liked her. Uh, and one of the things I found out up there, that those, those prostitutes were great people. Uh, I liked them whores. A boy could go up over the theater, and it was a whorehouse over top of the theater. You could go up there, and uh, for 50 cents, you could go to bed with a prostitute. That's one we didn't all come down with something terrible, because we all did it. And uh, and these girls was just as sweet to us as they could be. You'd think it was your lifelong girl, that she was your lifelong girlfriend. And uh, she first before, before you had sex, she had to wash your pecker. So she dipped, you stood over top of the bowl, dropped it into the bowl, and she. Uh, she would scrub it for you a little bit. Well, you were about half half finished anyway by then. But then you'd go to bed with them, and it was over in just a couple minutes. And uh, and we went from there sometimes down to uh, uh, the south part of across the Patapsico River, the south part of Baltimore, uh, where the stevedores all lived. Con uh, the Irish and the Italian stevedores all worked down there. They were all, all the Irish and the, the Italians were part of the mafia. Mafia was big in Baltimore, uh, Italian and Irish. And most of the Irish came from Dover, Delaware, I think. Uh, I was told that uh, uh, Joe Biden's father came from Baltimore and he was Irish, supposedly, and. Uh, uh, and was part of that Irish Mafia. And I guess that's where Joe Biden gets his foolishness from. Okay, well, I'm, uh, well, I got another little piece of a story here. Dad and I used to go fishing when I was a little boy. He had built uh, a rowboat, and we would row out into the mouth of the Patapsico River and drift with the tide into the bay and down the Chesapeake Bay for maybe 30 miles or 20 miles and uh, and fish all the way down, dragging the bait on the bottom and uh, catching fish, drift fishing, they called it. And, uh, and then when the tide turned and started coming back in, we'd drift back up the bay and the fish would really, man, they were excited because they were in there to feed from, they'd come in from the ocean to feed. And uh, we'd catch a ton of fish. Sometimes we'd catch 200 croaker or uh, uh, 500 uh, uh, white perch. Uh, you could fill the lauders up with them. And, uh, and then when we got close to Baltimore, we'd row into Bear Creek, where we lived, and, keep, and tie the boat off at a, uh, an old uh, steamboat dock that was in there. And, uh, uh, and we had would have left the wagon, my wagon, uh, there on the dock, and we'd put the baskets of fish in the wagon, and we'd, we'd uh, wheel them back home. 
Well, somewhere shortly after that, uh, Dad started hauling planks off the uh, old sailing ships that had hauled up and hauled up, sailed up into the creeks and allowed to sink there, took the mass off of them because it could sell the mass, and allowed the boats, the ships to sink there. So that was, uh, they were covered in good cypress planking and uh, white oak and uh, Georgia, heart Georgia pine planking. Dad started hauling that stuff to our piece of land there in Dundalk, and he had been building on a house before I was born. He would add that stuff, siding onto the house and that kind of thing. Uh, beautiful long leaf pine floors. He machined up out of wide, wide planks and made flooring out of it. And uh, when the house was basically built, he started building a sailboat. And he built a 40-foot Sharpie sailboat, schooner, for us to go fishing in, the whole family. And we would sail down the bay in that thing, uh, the whole family, and we would fish. Sometimes we'd pull into a little town there or something and maybe anchor and spend the night in the creek and then sail back up the bay to Baltimore. And uh, and we would, we would uh, uh, have fish for the winter. Mom would smoke it, or Dad would smoke it, and Mom would can it sometimes. And uh, so we had fish for the winter. But not only that, we had a quarter-acre garden. So being Southerners, Southerners they grew uh, speckled baby butter beans, and they grew uh, uh, tomatoes and corn. Uh, Dad had golden bantam corn, which was a smaller corn stalk, but and the ears were a little smaller, but they were sweet. Oh, that was some kind of good corn. Now, let me tell you, Mom canned it. And so we didn't spend any money on, on uh, food other than coffee and a couple incidental sugar, uh, a few things like that. Uh, Dad's brothers' wives would ship us rice because we ate rice and beans. George crackers eat a lot of rice because they grew it down there and it was cheap. So we had rice with uh, baby speckled, speckled butter beans on it. Okra, we ate a lot of okra. And they sent us okra seed and all that kind of stuff up on the uh, East Coast Champion uh, train. And uh, we ate that stuff and we loved it. We all grew up eating Southern food. And let me tell you what, they ain't nothing like Southern food. If you live in Baltimore, well, they don't eat nothing but sweet, but mashed potatoes and, and gravy and, and uh, steak or uh, chopped up potatoes and steak, uh, which was about as bland as anything I can imagine when you're used to eating corn and fish and soft crabs and uh, crab meat and... All of the kind of stuff that we, we got out of the base. So Dad didn't make a lot of money in those years because it was Depression years, and a dollar was worth $20 in today's money or $100 in today's money. You could buy a Coca-Cola for a nickel. That meant you could buy, for a dollar, you could buy 20 Coca-Colas. Now, they were a little smaller than today's Coca-Colas, but... You could get 20 of them for a dollar. So that kind of tells you what the value of a, uh, uh, of a dollar was. You could go to the movies for 11 cents. Uh, I could buy uh, a pickle for uh, at the uh, McKeever's Delicatessen. I could buy a, a, a pickle two inches in diameter and... Uh, eight inches long, salted out of a salt barrel for a nickel. So I, they'd give me 25 cents to go to the movies, to see the matinee on Saturday, go in there, pay 11 cents. Well, first we'd stop and get a pickle and eat it on the way to the movie theater. And then we'd go into the Abbey Lane movie theater and uh, uh, we'd, eat, uh, we'd eat candy. You'd get three or four pieces of candy per penny. And... On the way home, we'd stop and get an ice cream at the drugstore and uh, a chocolate Coke was my favorite, what I usually got. And we'd still have a few pennies left over from that uh, 25 cents. 
So any time during the week, the school was not too far from the delicatessen. could walk over there and uh, get some penny candy or something at lunchtime. And uh, we could go to Reed's Drug Store. I, I wouldn't half eat when I was a kid, so uh, Mom always give me a little bit extra every day, a few pennies extra so that I could go to Reed's Drug Store and I could get a bowl, little bowl of soup and a, uh, and a sandwich for, uh, I don't know, about 10 cents, I think, or 8 cents or something like that. It was, it was as cheap as buying a school lunch. And it was a hell of a lot better than the school lunches. So, uh, we had a good time as boys and girls. We, there wasn't no sissies among us because you had to fight sometimes when you went into them Italian neighborhoods up there. And if you went messing around in Patterson Park, the Italians and the Polish would meet in the middle and beat the living hell out of each other. Well, we thought it was great to get on the sidelines and watch. And, uh, of course, sometimes it would spill over and we'd get involved and get beat up too. Uh, and I'll tell you what, they didn't show anybody any mercy in them days. They, uh, when they decided to beat somebody, they, they knew how to do it. They were good at it. And you found that out if you started trying to date them Italian boys' sisters because they had to go to church every Saturday morning and confess to the priest what wrong they had done. And, uh, of course, that was kind of good for them because they could go out on Friday night and party and uh, have sex and everything else and uh, and drink too much beer and whatever and then go and uh, be forgiven on Saturday morning. But let me tell you, if you wasn't a Catholic and you tried to make time with one of them girls, you had to really do it on a sly. You had to take them off in the woods someplace or something where their brothers couldn't, couldn't catch a hold of you. And then you'd sneak them back to the house and they'd go back in the house and that'd be the end of that. But uh, we had such a good time. Baltimore was an industrial town. There was plenty of money flowing. And by plenty of money, I mean a guy could make forty dollars a week uh, before the uh, before World War II. Now my father was a machinist and he made about eighty he made about double that, eighty dollars a week. So we lived pretty high on the hog when you consider that we had new furniture in the house and we had, you know, uh, fill gas stoves and uh, uh, we always had a decent car. The first car I remember was a model A Ford uh, sedan and Dad had a one-horse scoop that he tied onto the back of that uh, Model A Ford. And when they dug the basin out, basement out uh, of the ground and piled the dirt up around the house in piles, then we, uh, we took that and we took turns handling the scoop. And Dad or my brother would drive the, the Ford and pull the scoop around and we'd dump it to level the ground out around the house to have a yard. It, it was great fun. You, you, you uh, would lift up on the handles just a little bit and uh, it would scoop into the, into the piles of dirt and drag it around. And when you got to the place where you wanted to dump it, you just lift up on the handle as hard as you could lift on them. That would, the scoop would dig in and the scoop would turn over and dump. And, uh, and that's how we made a yard around our house. Uh, Mr. Uh, Swift up the road was a steel mill supervisor. And he also was a bad drunk. And he got fired for drinking on a job. Well, there was a uh, Mr. Kovach who took his job. And Mr. Kovach, I, I think they got into a fight at Bethlehem Steel because they hated each other. And so Mr. Kovach, out of spite, bought Mr. Swift's house and property when it was put up for sale. So Mr. Swift told Dad, he says, Fred, he says, come up here and dig all these pine trees up that I've planted around this house, and you take them down and put them in your yard. I don't want Kovach to have my trees. So Dad did. And so we all went down there, and all the girls, and my brother and I, and my mother and Dad, and dug them trees up two or three of them into the one horse scoop and drug them down the road on a gravel road, took them in the yard, 
dug holes uh, in the yard and, and uh, planted the trees. So we had beautiful pine trees all around the house. I don't know, there was about 12 of them, I think. And they were really pretty. We had uh, two pear trees, one some other kind of tree, I don't know what that was, in the middle between them. And then uh, about uh, 30, 40 yards over, there was uh, three apple trees. We had a grape arbor full of yellow grapes. We had a... Uh, a bunch of uh, strawberries in a strawberry patch, and we had a bunch of blackberries in a blackberry patch. We had, we ate like kings and queens. I'm gonna tell you what, we didn't have a lot of money to throw around, but we sure did eat good. We had a good time there in Dundalk. My sisters were pretty girls. Both of them were absolutely beautiful. And uh, the boys just clamored around our house. Uh, my brother, who was he was 14 years older than me, and when I got to be, I don't know, 12 years old or something, he was in his upper teens. Well, we had a basement home. We put up a petition between one side of the basement and the other side. One side was a workshop, the other side, uh, and also where Mom stored her uh, canned vegetables. Uh, and uh, the other side uh, was a big open space, kind of about, I don't know, 15 feet wide or 20 feet wide, about 20 feet wide and and uh, 50 feet, 40 feet long, probably 45 feet long. We, uh, Charlie painted the walls pale blue, painted the floors uh, kind of a maroon or burgundy color. We painted a big blue, pale blue star in the middle of the floor with a circle around it. Up on the walls, one end of the basement, he painted, he painted a... a in the Poplar Mechanics magazine, there was a, a layout of squares with a picture of the Indian on horseback praying, uh, and it was called the end of a, the, he was sitting on a horse, his head leaned down, and the horse's head was just about touching the ground. And the name of that was End of the Trail, and the end of the other, and the other one was an Indian praying, and he drew squares on the wall to match the ones in the except five, ten times bigger, uh, and and then drew, because they were inside the squares, he was able to draw little tiny short sections of it, painted them up, and they were pretty, and a big dancing star. Well, I was younger, and it was my job to crank the Victrola. We had an old crank-up Victrola uh, that we played records on and for the girls to dance and the boys to dance. So they all came to our house every Saturday night for, and they'd come there to dance. And mom and dad would chaperone them. They'd go sit in the, in the uh, basement and kind of keep an eye on them, make sure nobody got too too rowdy or the boys didn't get too, too rough with the girls and all of that. They had a good time. I'd crank it, make Victrola, and then I'd go step back, and it would play, you know, as Victrolas do, sound like a scratchy old piece of music, but they didn't care. And as soon as it started slowing down just a little bit, I'd crank it back up again, and away we'd go. And it was a little, a young little girl there. She was she was younger than my sister Madge. Madge was six years older than me. She was Madge's best friend. They knew each other. The girl was Italian, and I can't remember her name, but she, she, uh, she and another girl jitterbugged all over the place. And Madge jitterbugged with them, and Charlie and Dot, and I would slow dance with some of the girls, and uh, a couple of Polish girls there taught me to polka a little bit. Well, well, later in high school or junior high school. Uh, the girls thought I was really neat because I could polka and I could uh, I could slow dance and back in those days it was called swing and uh, I could swing dance and uh, so I was kind of popular and uh, I was sweet on a little girl over in Dundalk we called it. it was about a mile over to her house and I'd walk over there to see her we'd stand around on the corner and talk it was Never any love making or anything like that. She wouldn't put up with that. But anyhow, uh, Shirley, her name was. 
and she had a girlfriend, big tall gal, about six foot tall, that was a senior. And they had a senior prom that year, and uh, she was had a date to go to the senior prom. She had a boyfriend. He come down with something, I don't know what it was, uh, measles maybe, I don't know, something like that, some childhood disease. So he couldn't go. The girl couldn't find a date. She was too tall for us, <laughs> most of the guys. And uh, so anyway, Cheryl asked me, she said, Doug, would you take her to the senior prom? And you'll have a good time. All the girls will want to dance with you. Well, I went home, and I was telling my sister Madge about it. And she said, Doug, you should go. You would have a good time, blah, 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 so on and so forth. I went. Mom took my brother's suit and shortened the pants up a little bit. And uh, so I had a suit, which was too big for me and white shirt and tie, and I took the girl to the prom. Now, I was probably, at that time, I was probably uh, about five foot three or something like that, or five foot two anyway. So, <laughs> looked like Mutt and Jeff going, and she was all dressed in a gown. She was beautiful. Oh, man, was she pretty. The girls just thought I was the cutest thing they ever saw, so... Uh, they all wanted to dance with me, so I danced with all the uh, uh, senior girls. Well, now, you know, they had those things that they had to fill out the n names of the guys they were going to dance with. Well, most of, them, they, most of them had their book filled with dances, and uh, so they had to push some of them off and give them a dance at the end or afterwards or something. Uh, in order to be able to dance with me because I was the most popular thing there. <laughs> and, uh, and it wasn't nothing except that I could dance a little bit. And uh, so anyway, I had the best time of my life. I'm going to tell you what, I thought them girls was absolutely going to hit titties. And my little girlfriends didn't have any yet much. And uh, so anyway, that was a good time. Met a girl named Jean Rao. She was kind of tall for me, and her father was a was a Navy. Uh, I forgot what, but he had some rank. He he wore a captain's hat and all of that instead of the sailor caps. And uh, he would go down in the basement to smoke his pipe and look at his pinup girls he had pinned all over the walls. And sometimes I'd go down there with him and talk talk with him. He was interesting. He had, according to him anyway, he had been in the, uh, he ran a landing barge uh, in the Navy uh, at the uh, invasion of Normandy uh, during World War II. He had medals all over the place. And uh, so anyway, I had a good time with him. But the girl was in love with the boy next door. Uh, and and but he wouldn't give her a tumble. He wanted to go to college to be a, a lawyer, which he did, and he didn't want to get tangled up with any girl. And I think it was something bad wrong with him. But anyway, I trade uh, I I'd have traded a, a college degree for, of any kind for that gal. So her and I dated a little bit. We'd go to the movies and stuff. I felt her giddies one time. <laughs> it was the thrill of my life. Anyway, uh, uh, I guess that's about enough of this. Uh, I'll let this run uh, and see if uh, if I got enough here for uh, AI to make a uh, a picture of me talking and uh, uh, and to talk what I write and say what I write, read it and say it, and I can make some videos of it. Okay, we'll see how this works out.